Um, and I'm convinced that most people have no idea what blockchain actually is. Uh, they just take it at face value. But I think of it, an easy way to think of it is it's literally a mechanism for uh, putting a time and timestamp and a geolocation on a transaction. Hmm. It's a way of tracking it in uh, digital space, as it were. But also blockchain is very slow. And so I've been watching um, Hashgraph mm -hmm. because Hashgraph is many, many, many times faster. But the problem is that Hashgraph is not an open source. The code is not open source. So people are a little hesitant to depend upon something. They can't get under the engine and see what's there. But I suspect that we're going to see a lot of competition to blockchain that's Hashgraph-like it's much faster and then it can be really introduced and implemented. So I think blockchain is, it's a brilliant idea, but in real life, it's just too slow. And then the next question is the cryptos that are built on top of that structure, that platform. And, um, and that's where we get into uh, government versus private. So I think, for example, in the U S the reason JP Morgan is, creating this new digital coin and um, the, the acquisition of Ethereum. All of that is that in the U.S., instead of having the government launch the cryptocurrency, the sovereign crypto, they have the private sector do the proof of concept. So that's what we're in, is that we're, we're witnessing the beginning of a U.S. sovereign cryptocurrency. It's just coming via J.P. Morgan. <laughs> and then the last thing I'll say on this is... Um, I've been speaking to like some of my some of my mates at the Fed uh, who take a more conservative position, and we jokingly say, you know, this is literally like heroin for politicians, because now you can create a whole new species of money that's not connected to any underlying value. It's not connected. You're not digitizing the pieces of paper anymore. You're creating a new thing that's not based on anything except faith and confidence. So you can literally double or have the money supply by touching one key on your keyboard. Mm. And more than that, if I was the president, I could say, right, I want to reward the voters who voted with me. And I want to put a thousand bucks worth of those sovereign crypto into the bank accounts of all those people to reward them for voting with me. Oh. And the people who didn't vote with me, I want to apply a tax to them. They have to pay me because they voted against me. This sovereign crypto opens the door for that kind of micromanagement of payments to and from voters. So I think it's a huge shift in the balance of power between states and citizens. That scared me and made me angry and did all the emotions to me when I thought about that idea. Wow. Okay. It's hmm. a powerful notion that people haven't begun to really think through what are the implications of a truly uh, digital species that's been invented um, using these new technologies. And I, I sent you earlier on the chat um, a link to an article I wrote a few years ago uh, about tally sticks, hmm. because it's a good example of this same phenomenon. So in Britain, for a thousand years, they used a system of money and accounting called tally sticks. And they were literally like these wooden boards and you crack them in half. And on one side, the short end of the stick, which is where we get that term, you kept a record of all your tax payments and what you owned and what you'd sold. And the other side went to the chancellor of the exchequer, or rather the, the treasury, to say what your, or your assets were. And um, that worked perfectly for a thousand years. But then there was so much debt left over from all the European wars. And the thing is, you couldn't inflate using tally sticks. It takes too long for the tree to grow, too long for you to record all your lifetime history. So they introduced a new technology. They said to the public, we're not going to use tally sticks anymore. We're going to use this new thing called paper money. <laughs> and the public are like, there, are you kidding? I'm not going to give up my wooden board with my name on it and my whole personal financial history for a piece of paper that doesn't have my name on it. So the government said, fine, we're going to come to your house and we're going to take the tally sticks and we're taking them to parliament and we're going to burn them. So you can't use them. You're forced to use paper money. 
Well, that was what caused Parliament to burn down in 1834. It was the destruction of the system of money and accounting and the introduction of a new one. Now, today, could you do the same? You just literally abandon the system of money and accounting and you start again. Yes, except mm. this time you won't need a fire. And that's why paying attention to sovereign crypto is so important because it's more than just a new form of money. It's a profoundly new form of the system of accounting as well. We have economist PhD and a policy advisor, award-winning author telling us right here, pay attention guys, that sovereign crypto is going to be huge in the making. Do some research. I already added her tally stick uh, a article that she wrote in the description so you can check it out there or I have it pulled up on screen as well. Um, Dr. Malbrim, thank you once again. Uh, I have a couple of questions from uh, Dakota Evans uh, about this kind of situation, uh, sort of, right? In the same vein, Dakota says, when GME goes to X number, when what does this mean for our economy and government? Would the entire market crash and everything reset before the government prints enough money to make 100K multi-millionaires? Uh, or for example, would now everybody just start using GME shares instead of fiat currency? What do you think? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Well, I think the key point is that the government has created all of you guys billionaires by printing so much money, as it were. Um, people will argue with me that money wasn't actually printed, but the point is liquidity was created. Um, and some of it has ended up in this space that you're talking about with these one or two companies. But it's not just those one or two companies. It's every company. It's the whole market. So have they created a many new millionaires? Yeah, I'd say there are a load of people. Actually, Brendan and I have talked about this a few times. There's a whole generation of people who just made a fortune in the stock market in the last couple of years that never expected to do so. So what do they do? Do they see themselves as professionals now? Do they view it as a one-off gift from heaven? which probably is, you know, more, more the case. Like, was it because they were brilliant geniuses or was it because they had a lucky moment in history? How sustainable is it? This is a really interesting question. Hmm. Uh, and there we have that question, right? Uh, it was more of a joke for uh, GME becoming the fiat currency, but I yeah, thank yeah. you for taking it seriously. <laughs> um, I think Liam Kyer also is asking a really excellent question. First of all, thank you, Wally Wall Street and Thomas Proctor. Uh, Liam says, hope it's not a dumb question, but what would happen if rather than a fiat currency gold standard reversion, it happened to crypto instead? We've been talking about that blockchain even on the congressional floor. Right. People are saying T plus two, T plus one, T plus zero. How about just instantaneous with blockchain? You mentioned that it was slow. Is it too slow to take over the actual market if Congress continues to talk about it? Yeah, it's too slow to take over. Yeah, hmm. it simply can't move fast enough. The, the amount of minutes required for each block, each chain is, is too great. Um, it, it's a speed issue. I think it's also an energy issue, but it's a speed issue more than anything. Right. Yeah, energy is an interesting topic that you mentioned here, right? Some of some people, when they ask them what are they going to do with their earnings from GME and AMC, they say, oh, I'm just going to start a Bitcoin mining farm. Uh, energy, right? We have Meatball right here as uh, <laughs> Professor Meatball, my dog, uh, as an NFT right here, right? So NFT, a Moon Platoon member made it. If you guys want to bid on this NFT and have your own NFT right now, the highest bid is a hundred bucks. So Meatball is already worth a hundred dollars on the blockchain. Um, but the energy that required to create this NFT and that continues to create not only non-fungible tokens, but also mining actual fungible tokens, what is the economic and environmental impact of that? It's massive. And I could pull out some things and put them in the chat on this, but people are realizing that that's not sustainable. So there has to be more innovation and it takes me back to, to Hashgraph. Mm. But again, there has to be also something new. And, um, you know, people are trying to deal with it by moving their data centers or their mining centers to places like the Arctic. You know, there's a, uh, in Svalbard in Norway, where the Global Seed Bank is, there's a mine half a mile down the road, and it's been turned into the place where you have these mining operations because the it's easier to do in the cold. You don't need to cool down the computers 
to do the mining. Hmm. So does that make it easier to contain the environmental impacts? <laughs> still, it's still expensive and it's still energy costly, no hmm. matter how you look at it. And, and that's the that's the issue right now, right? When we were switching from tally sticks to paper money, maybe a couple more trees were going to be cut down, right? Exactly. But but it's not like an entire nation's worth of energy will be expended in instance because of cryptocurrency is being a brand new, if you guys didn't know, it takes a lot of energy. So that's the context that we were talking about right now to continue to mine these cryptocurrencies. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but listen, I just, I, I'm, I've got a dash to my next thing, but sure. I wanted to say, Thank you so much. And I love, by the way, watching some of the other people who, who, you know, do this kind of thing and interact with you. There are some, there are some cool guys who come on to this and have commentary. And I really appreciate the dialogue and the back and forth. Um, you're kind of doing, um, you're doing good work trying to get to the heart of the matter in very, very complex issues. So congratulations. And I can see why you've got 100,000 people following you. Almost, almost. Two weeks okay, away. get you there. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Pippa Malgram, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. You're more, more than welcome to come back anytime. I do have a quick question. I, I'm going to preempt some of the live chat by saying I think some of you want just to hear your voice clip of saying that you like the stock. Do you think that you can say that? <laughs> you know what? I don't have a view. i got to tell you because I'm, I am not trading in it. And um, but what I like is the level of public interest in this stock. Okay. Now, the stock will still do its up and its down, and I don't have a view on the direction right now today. But I do have a view that this conversation that you guys are having is going to be very influential on the course of public policy. Uh, and that, there you have it, Honorary Moon Platoon member, uh, Pip, Dr. Pippa Malgrim. Anything you would like in the description, you have it. Uh, what would you like to plug? I notice a book over your shoulder. Is that something you want to leave us with? Uh, yeah, well, so I, do, I write books. My most recent book is called um, The Infinite Leader. It's a book about leadership. And actually, maybe what you're doing is a great example of it. Because it's very much about how you often think the leader is that other person over there with the big title. But it isn't. It's you. It's me. It's all of us individuals exercise leadership all the time. And what you've done with this program is to exercise leadership in this space and to create a place where a conversation can be had that didn't exist before. And I think it's happening all over the world. And it's a very powerful phenomena. It's a kind of revolution. Mm -hmm. um, at, a, at a moment in history, by the way, where the digitization of reality, which is what we're doing right now on Zoom, and that's why Zoom is worth more than Exxon Mobile, right? It's because this digitization phenomena allows so much productivity. And maybe what happened with the, the Robin Hood crowd going up against the hedge funds, it's like a digital flash mob. It, it's maybe, is it like the French of the barricades in the French Revolution? You know, it's, it's that kind of thinking that made me interested in the work we're doing. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'm a little starstruck, so I'm not uh, as eloquent as I usually am, but I've included your book in the description of this video. Everybody check out her book. Uh, she you. is an award-winning author. She is a PhD. She is Dr. Pippa Malmgren. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.